All right, welcome everybody to our seventh Aliens Among Us q and I'm Andrew Cox, the CEO of the Invasive Species Council. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that I'm talking to you today from Gandagara and Darak land. I want to pay my respects to the elders of this land, but also to the elders of all the lands we're coming from in Australia. Um, and, and, and welcome to any Indigenous people who are with us today, and welcome to any Maori people who are with us today. And uh, before I go on, I've, we've got a special guest, Nicoli, Nicola Toki, but I might get Nicola to do a special acknowledgement for our Maori friends. Nicola. Tina Koto Kato, Ngamahinui Kia Koto, Hikarakia. Um, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mākina, ki a kiuta, ki a mātara, tara ki tai, e hia ki a nā te atakura, he teo, he huka, he hau hau, te hei mauri ora. Uh, and just for your benefit, that means cease the winds from the west, cease the winds from the south, let the breeze blow over the land and over the ocean, let the red-tipped dawn come with a sharpened ear, a touch of frost, and a, <laughs> which is true here in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand today, and a promise of a glorious day. Kia ora. Thank you, Nicola. I'll introduce you formally in a minute. Um, lovely to have that warm welcome and acknowledgement. Um, also today, we've got our panelists. Uh, we've got Tim Lowe, who's a writer and ecologist. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Andrew. And we've got Rebecca Spindler, who's the Conservation Director for Bush Heritage Australia. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks, Andrew. Lovely to be here. And I'd like to recognise that today I'm coming from Gubby Gubby in Jinnabara country and recognise that as I stand on Australian soil, I stand on Aboriginal land, land that was never ceded. Thank you. Thank you. So unfortunately, two of our regular panellists, our ambassadors, Christine Milne and Richard Swain, can't make it today. Christine's at a Global Greens conference in South Korea, and Richard had an unexpected uh, health issue he needed to deal with with his family. Um, just a reminder, Aliens Among Us is an interactive session. We want you to ask questions of our special guests today. Um, so please um, use the Q&A button down the bottom. Don't use the chat, use the Q&A button because that's your chance to ask, ask questions of uh, Nicola and the panelists because we want, we want to have an engaging discussion um, about Predator Free 2050 and Nicola's perspective on that. So um, just a reminder, use the Q&A button. Now let's get going. Um, our special guest, as I mentioned, is Nicola Toki. Uh, Nicola is the CEO of Forest and Bird, uh, the, the leading environment group in New Zealand. Uh, but she's had a mixed background, both working in government and the NGO sector. So she brings a really diverse perspective to this issue. And she's one of the, the drivers behind predator-free 2050 idea that we're so jealous of in Australia. So um, look, today is to get to know a bit of, uh, about Nicola and, and the issues that around predator-free 2050. So I might just jump into it. So Nic Nicola, tell me a bit about you. I wanna to get to know what drives you uh, around your love of nature in New Zealand. Just set the scene a bit about uh, how you got involved and how you, you know, your passion about nature in New Zealand. Uh, thank you. And um, kia, ora, kia ora again. So, um, wow, I could take the whole hour, so I'll try and be concise. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I was fortunate um, enough to, uh, as a child, spent a lot of time um, on my um, grandparents, particularly my nana's um, native bush block up the back of their farm. And she taught us a lot about the bush. I spent a lot of time camping with my family. That really um, contributed to, you know, my kind of the joy, I suppose, and the passion that, that I know many of us share um, with nature. And then we moved around a lot. And um, one of the places we moved when I was seven um was Araki Mount Cook National Park so so that's that's the home of um New Zealand's 
tallest mountain and significant mountain range lots of amazing species to be found there um and i suppose having grown up uh with that all around me i had no choice really whether i realized it or not um that nature was going to form a part of of everything i chased from that point on that and obviously um and again i'm sure like many of you i was that kid who dragged every kind of pet home um and you know had uh had an un unfortunate uh experience where I was keeping a bunch of tadpoles in a in a bowl on the counter which then one morning we discovered had turned turned into tiny frogs all over our house so <laughs> just just that kind of thing it just tickled me and still does <laughs> and birds are a central part to your 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 life and you know the is that, that a tui behind you what what bird is that yeah, that is um, that is one of our beautiful um, native birds in New Zealand. That is a tui or a um, parson bird. Favorite fact about the tui because you quite often see them calling. Um, oh, you might like this, Tim, um, and can't hear um, what you know. You can see their mouth kind of going like this. Um, we can't hear the all of the songs that the tui produce. They're also very clever mimics. Um, but also they have two voice boxes to my understanding, so they can kind of crank out in stereo uh, their songs to the world. So yeah, New Zealand's identity is very much uh, anchored in uh, our native bird fauna. And, and I guess this is the big thing that's driving your work around predator free 2050. Um, what is it, which species do you, you have, in your your mind, is doing the most damage to the birds? Yeah, I mean, in New Zealand, it's very simple, right? If it's and it's so different and yet so similar to the situation um, in Australia. So in New Zealand, if an animal has four legs and fur, then it didn't evolve here and it didn't grow up here. So those little kind of warm-blooded, bitey things are um, causing major um challenges and a crisis and in fact you know we've had a 50 extinctions in the last hundred or so years already um i can't <laughs> i know that everyone um expects me to say the things that are well within the frame of predator free 2050 which is we have stoats ferrets and weasels and the mustelid family and we have rats we have a few species of those and possums but the ones that are sneaking up under the radar that people don't necessarily think about are things like hedgehogs, for example. So in New Zealand, um, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle is not the kindly character that we've been brought up to believe. And um, that's quite challenging, you know, for us to get our heads around. There is basically a hedgehog per hectare across the country of New Zealand, at least one. Uh, and one was once seen trying to cross the Tasman Glacier. So they are somewhat omnipresent in our landscape. <laughs> Wow, that's pretty robust. I might just bring in some of the other panelists uh, now. So, Tim, uh, Tim Lowe, your most recent book was Where Song Began. So you know a lot about you know a lot about birds. Um, as an Australian ecologist who's recently visited New Zealand, tell us what you noticed about New Zealand and um, something that um, maybe might be of interest to Australians. Well. Um... I mean, obviously, I could talk about the lack of mammals, but there's, I mean, Nicholas covered that. But I think that um, going bird watching, the extent to which you're in the forests looking for birds and there's just traps everywhere, these long um, traps that get um, particularly stoats and rats, and that um, they can be every 20 metres long track, and that even with these traps everywhere, there aren't many birds. There just aren't many birds in forest. But then I went to um, Ulva Island on this trip off Stewart Island, um, ostensibly rat-free. Unfortunately, there were signs there saying a few rats have recently reappeared, but just teeming with birds. It's just car cars um, and parakeets and robins just all, all, all over you and just constant wall of bird noise. And then you go back to Stewart Island um, and Stuart Island, he's got traps everywhere, but it's got rats, it's got possums. And, um, I mean, it, <laughs> New Zealand standards is good because you can see carcass flying around, but um, it really doesn't have many birds. And you go to mainland rainforests and you can walk 15 minutes and not see a bird. And you're actually seeing more traps than you are birds. And just the sense that 
how uphill it is, how there's just so much human endeavour in killing mammals just to make sure that there are some birds in the landscape, but that with all that human endeavour, they're not, they're not, they're not safe because um, there are rats on Wilbur Island and not that many birds on the mainland. Mm, big differences. Um, Beck, I'll bring you in. Rebecca Spindler from Bush Heritage Australia. Um, tell us a bit more about your sort of uh, love and nature. And, um, you know, I guess uh, you're a bird watcher too, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Um, a very unkind Twitter friend calls me a bird noticer because I'm, I'm not necessarily the best at identifying until I've got them zoomed in on my, my photo that I've just taken because my eyesight's pretty bad. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, we had a fantastic session, joint session with some bird life experts the other day and, and figuring out how we take a unified approach really to assessing the health of our landscapes uh, using birds because birds are the most ubiquitous, certainly observable species that we can, we can analyse completely non-invasively. You can walk through a grassland, a forest, a woodland, a wetland, and understand how well it's serving its purpose and functioning and how healthy it is by the life that's in it that's really obvious. And I think so many of those, you know, the vegetation sets the scene is, is sort of the set of the opera, but the birds are birds are the song, you know, they're, they're, they're the thing that brings everything to, to light and colour. And so we often use that um, consistent approach and, and the bird life experts were just so fantastic in taking us through their method. And now we're thinking about how we can have 24 seven little audiometers sitting there. So no cost volunteers sitting there recording all of the bird song. And we're trying to analyze that bird song and figure out what that means for the health of an ecosystem across the country. All right, thanks Beck. I'm gonna come back to Nicola because um, we wanna actually start to explore a bit about what New Zealand's doing around this uh, horrendous problem you mentioned, you said 50 extinctions. Uh, I, I imagine they're all bird extinctions um, that have happened in New Zealand so far. And, and I guess this is what was driving the conception of predator-free 2050. I mean, it's a good starting point, like Beck talks about that birds are, a, there's already high awareness in the community about birds, you, you must think. So maybe talk a bit about um, how, what predator free 2050 is and maybe some of those early days when um, it was just an idea in people's minds sure and just building on what um both tim and um bex have said you know when um captain cook first visited new zealand um they um they described him and joseph banks or in joseph banks stories they described the dawn chorus as deafening uh, and and when, on one or two occasions, they actually had to move the boat away from shore because they couldn't. The sailors weren't getting any sleep because the noise was too much. Uh, and we have lost that soundtrack. Um, and so you know that that gives us the sense of what's at stake here. And it hasn't. You know, birds formed the most of the extinctions or, or the, the the larger share of the extinctions, but not just birds. We we also lost a species of bat as recently as the 1960s when a rat plague got onto one of our offshore islands south of um, Stewart Island and wiped out two um, species of bird and one species of rat, uh, so one species of bat. Um, so, you know, these are real and, and present dangers. And so um, in New Zealand, what we're really good at is island eradications. And, and I'm sure you know this because when you are working on your island eradications, I'll almost put money on the fact that there will be a New Zealander involved uh, <laughs> in, in um, helping that. Uh, and perhaps even a New Zealand helicopter pilot, depending on how you're going about it. Um, and so uh, we know that when you, it's, that's a very, very simple recipe. So when you take those predators away, then you get what Tim described on um, he heard on Olver Island, which is you know the 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 wildlife comes back and um, you know you'll note that uh, Forest and Bird's celebrating our centennial at the moment, and the founder of Forest and Bird used to say you know give nature a chance and she will repair herself, and that's very much what happens here. Well, what the the problem was though that um, 
while we could do that on offshore islands, we were losing species everywhere and losing populations everywhere on the mainland. Um, and so, you know, you can either create an island on the mainland and we have a number of um, predator-proof sanctuaries, fenced sanctuaries, where we basically got an, a, you know, an inside out island, if you like. Um, and those have helped bring species back to the mainland, but without those fences, the, the birds just can't endure. And that's because, if you think about our species having evolved with no terrestrial predators for the entire hundreds of thousands or millions of years of evolution, suddenly being faced with an onslaught um, of, you know, more than a dozen introduced predators, it makes life very difficult for them. So um, the idea came about, it was first posited to me in um, probably 2011, uh, where um, a gentleman who had, who wasn't an ecologist, who liked to spend time in the bush and was really concerned about the silence that um, Tim described here in New Zealand, um, wanted to do something about it. He was also a businessman and he didn't like all this sort of faffing about with constantly having to control year on year on year and pour money into that and why not just do um, get rid of the lot. And in my experience, I'd never heard anyone in New Zealand talk about eradication across the mainland. I'd only ever heard about control. And so um, we were able to start teasing that idea out. In 2012, we held a little secret meeting, if you like, where I, I brought kind of about 20 scientists and experts and practitioners into a room and said, just tell me, like, could, could it be done? What do you think? Um, and they basically took about half a day to to say that, you know, funding notwithstanding and with some expected advances in kind of blue sky technology, yes, it could be done. But the next day and a half was arguing about how we would build the social license in order for that to be true. So um, in 2016, the New Zealand government announced that our aim um, across governments, so it exists no matter what flavour of government we have, uh, would be for um, aiming for a predator free 2050. And, and in some ways, that's kind of the wrong approach because, you know, and I'm sure the ecologists among you all will be saying, hang on, the outcome you're seeking isn't predator free. The outcome is more birds. Um, but it's a bit more of a mouthful to say, you know, um, heaps more birds and, and hardly any predators by 2050. So uh, that's how it, hit, it kind of started to be pitched. And it just built, it snowballed from the grassroots up. Yeah, wow. And it's, I mean, it's pretty amazing, but tell me of the species that Predator Free 2050 is focused on, what feral cats don't seem to be included. I mean, in Australia, we're quite aware of the impacts of cats. They're the biggest driver of uh, mammal loss in Australia. Over 25 mammals have become extinct in Australia on, um, from cats. Um, I mean, interestingly, um, our our birds haven't been as impacted on the mainland. They have been impacted, but it's on the islands where they do the most damage. Tell me why cats aren't part of the official list for Predator Free 2050. Yeah, I mean, it's a fair enough question. Um, and we definitely have a big cat-shaped hole in our um, Predator, Predator Free 2050 approach. I mean, a part of that is um, it really wasn't kind of politically palatable at the time and so you know New Zealanders weren't ready for that conversation at that time and that is moving and I'll get on to that in a second so um I think uh more than 40 percent of all New Zealand households have at least one cat um we have almost zero well pretty much no regulations around cats so for example you know most in most places in New Zealand you can only have a certain number of dogs they must be registered you're not allowed them off your property etc cetera, etc cetera. in New Zealand our cultural context has been that you know puss can go wherever they want whenever they want because it's mean not to let them um increasingly we are moving to um a real appetite um for management of cats and what one of the things that Florissant Bird has been working really hard on is advocating for a cat management act but so too is the vet association so too is the society for the prevention of cruelty to animals um, and in New Zealand we have a real problem with feral cats they are roaming further than you could we ever thought they could they're in high alpine areas and we know for a fact that they are the most significant predator alongside stoats of adult kia, which are our alpine um, parrots, right? And so pretty much nothing will knock over an adult kia, but cats and stoats do. And, and because they are the most valuable birds in the population, in terms of being the breeding ones, um, that's that's hugely challenging. So 
Um, I I'm I sometimes look over the ditch and and I'm a bit jealous about what I see um, with some of the um, some of the parts of Australia who are working quite hard on trying to manage cats. Um, I think New Zealand will get there, but we were a bit too sucky to have the conversation <laughs> ten years ago. The sucky, wow. I guess there's the feral cat and the domestic cat parts of this equation, but maybe the person who can speak a bit about what's going on on feral cats in Australia is Rebecca. Rebecca, I'll bring you in here. Um, tell me a bit about uh, what's happened in Australia about feral cats, and would you uh, agree that um, we're less sooky than New Zealanders? Uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't have a dog in that fight, Andrew, and I'm not getting drawn into it, but <laughs> I, yeah, definitely think we've made a fair bit of progress. I think our pre uh, previous to last, actually, Threatened Species Commissioner, uh, Gregory Andrews, did a fantastic job in raising the awareness of the impact of feral cats really across the country based in science, and that actually then generated a whole lot of new science. I think our understanding of the integrated threats. So looking at cat behaviour, particularly after a fire and, and remembering um, the really terrible fires of 2019, 2020, we know billions of animals were killed by the fires, but then also by the increased access to predators because so much of the cover had been reduced. So I think there's all of that, the foundation of science, the in, improved understanding of the impact of cats, also some innovation around how we might manage cats more effectively, both as individual household um, managers, but also in the in the broader landscape. The Felix, a program that really is very targeted around feral cats is, is a fantastic innovation. But then just continuing that science, investment in science to understand the impact of cats and how we might drive that further innovation forward to make sure that we've got a genuinely national plan. You know, and I note Nicola's comment before about going from a, a really tiny island to a larger island to, to the actual two islands of, of mainland New Zealand, now scale it up to Australia. How, how are we going to do that really across the country? But I think we're definitely starting from a position where as long as it is I think any any cult needs to be humane. You know, it needs to be as humane as it possibly can. As long as we are to undertaking methods that are as humane as they possibly can be, I think the Australian public is with us in trying to rid Australia of one of the greatest threats or several of the greatest threats because you can't think about cats alone. You've got to think about the cats and foxes and rabbits all interacting together. Um, and making sure that we, we're tipping the balance in term, in, for our native species to thrive and survive. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Nicola, I'll bring you back in again. Um, I mean, this, this, I guess if you call it, want to call it a, a social license to act and, and, and bringing the community with you is pretty important. And I'm thinking about cats again and um, um, some of the lack you may have got or involving children in some of the programs. So I, I know there's some, um, recently there was a bit of concern from overseas about a cat culling competition for under 14s. Um, and you've also, I understand, well, I know that possums are part of your predator free by 2050 program. And um, there was also a bit of pushback against a possum cull a few years ago involving children yeah, I guess we need to make sure everything's, uh, you know, what we do with feral animals is humane, but what about the involvement of children and how the community reacts to that? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and my thinking has changed on this over time. Um, and I think too, it's really important to remember that context is king here, right? It's not like we're saying to kids, you know, we want you to go out and murder a whole lot of animals because it's a great thing to do. Um, and whenever kids or young people are involved in um, in trapping or or um, or shooting or anything like that, because and, that, and maybe that's part of it too. Is as Tim described, you know, there's traps everywhere in New Zealand. Most communities have a trapping program. Often families and kids are involved. Um, the message that I try to instill with my not quite ten year old um, is around. No one, no one willingly wants to go out and hurt another thing, take a, take a life of another thing, right? That's not something that's kind, um, except that, you know, we were trapping hedgehogs in our backyard 
uh, he is he is a um, a wannabe um, dinosaur expert, but particularly herpetology is his thing. He knows that for our very fragile lizard fauna here in New Zealand, hedgehogs are a significant and major threat. So while we both stood over the kind of you know slightly manky hedgehog we were trying to take out of the trap, and we're sad about the fact that the hedgehog um, was was over, uh, he knows that he's trying to create a safer habitat for geckos and skinks so it's really important I think um no one wants to encourage kids to be cruel to anything to other people or to animals um but when we are talking about um a stark choice of a, a country full of pests versus the things that are only found here or in your case only found in Australia then I think that those how you have those conversations is crucial yes totally agree I might bring in Tim here Tim what does this say about the cultural differences between New Zealanders and Australians and maybe where the different countries are on that journey of, of awareness raising? Yeah, I certainly think um, I you know, read a lot of these um, media articles about the school controversies. And I mean, the whole issue in New Zealand where uh, a normal way for a school to raise funds is to have possum shooting that can involve the parents of the school kids that can involve the kids themselves and that in some of these country schools these possum throwing contests there was one dressing up dead possums in clothes that this is really um it really is a bit over the top and that i got a bit obsessed with this online because you could see some urban schools where i'd say that you know it's a very progressive approach teaching empathy uh teaching school kids here's a trap we put it in the school grounds we've got a rat uh, the rat's dead. We're going to respectfully um, you know, give it give it its best wishes and bury it. So there's really respectful approaches. And then you get into these rural schools where it's really pretty rough. And the pictures of kids waving around dead rats and um, prize for the dead rat with the biggest teeth. I mean, so um, I think there's a kind of country urban uh, schism, or, or uh, in, in terms of the values and that. If there's a risk to the social license of what is happening to New Zealand, it is particularly around, I think, rural children uh, being perceived to be encouraged by adults to be, you know, very disrespectful to the animals they're killing. And that um, I, you know, I personally, and I, you know, obviously here I am Invasive Species Council, I want to see feral animals killed, but I'm not comfortable with what I see, have seen going on in, in in some of these New Zealand rural schools that um, it, it it just doesn't look right to me. Mm. Nicola, you, I, I mean, I, I know what you said before, but um, you're also, um, I've heard you say you've, we should be maybe killing with kindness. Um, maybe do you want to talk a bit more about that concept, Nicola? Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to what Tim's just described. So um, actually, yeah, I agree. I don't think it is appropriate or, in, and, you know, as a mum now, it kind of makes me, gives me the heebie-jeebies to think about, you know, throwing dead animals or dressing them up or whatever. Um, so uh, this, this, I, this idea of um, killing with kindness is very much about... Um, Focusing on the reason that we've that we've sort of had to, you know, if you like, go into battle against these introduced mammals, and that, that we're not doing this because we've sort of lost the plot and gone a bit Lord of the Flies, and you know, we're we're out on some kind of massive spree. We're doing this to protect those things that belong here, so that they can have a chance to exist. Um, the there was a there was a cat. Um, uh, hunting competition for under 14s not not far from where I live I might add uh, I'm, I'm out in rural um, uh, Canterbury in the South Island um, and Forest and Beauty actually came out against it and just said it wasn't wasn't appropriate and that kids um, needed to you know to it's a it's really tricky to kill a cat and if you want to do it humanely there's only a couple of um, approved ways to do that um, and that's not something that kids necessarily have the skills that, you, you know, the, the mental skills, but actually just the practical um, skills and qualifications to do. So, again, you know, if we don't deal through these pests and if kids aren't involved, how do they understand the story of what's at stake 
in our, you know, in terms of our wildlife in New Zealand, how do we engage them? And, and it was a big surprise to me starting my conservation career some more than 20 years ago and getting really excited about my first job with the Department of Conservation and sitting in a tea room, you know, fresh out of university and I'd learned lots about ecology and zoology and I was going to save the things to realise that most of those people in that tea room were there to kill stuff and uh that was that was quite confronting and so to, we have to build that story over time I think so that you know the public understand what it's all about yeah it, it can be confronting I mean as an Australian visiting New Zealand to see as Tim mentioned those um predator traps everywhere um and even some of the ingenious um mechanisms you've dev devised to kill things like ferrets and stoats and weasels um little machines that guillotine their heads I mean it's quite extraordinary but also quite gruesome um I just want to touch on for a second you know just sticking with this theme about how we I, I, I guess help the public understand that the challenge that's needed that some of the difficult decisions we need to make to actually achieve the bringing back the bird song uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, pesticides and because I think, think this is also part of that um journey you bring the people along with and and one in particular which is quite controversial uh, in australia the use of the toxin 1080 um just do you want to talk a bit about um the how you've addressed people's concerns about the use of 1080 because we know it can cause maybe some suffering um, for some animals uh, a lot of the research isn't sort of fully uh, completed on that yet but you know, it definitely is controversial. So talk a bit about some of the, uh, I guess, the bans that were threatening New Zealand and what you did about that. Sure, and, and I wouldn't say we have won over all of the public with respect to the use of 1080 in New Zealand either. I don't think that would quite be true, but I think what we've tried to do as conservationists in New Zealand over the last several decades is explain again what's at stake you know this is this is there's a couple of things 1080 has become certainly in our country and, and the little bit that I've looked into in terms of the pushback in Australia it seems a bit similar it's become one of those things that just has the name of it has has it's it's become something in people's heads that's almost like a dirty word you know and I often kind of wondered whether if we change the name to I don't know you know eco love or something um we might <laughs> we might get further along um, 1080, you know, if, if, if I say to New Zealanders who are upset and worried about things like 1080, if I say to them, listen, what if, what if we designed a toxin that pretty much only targeted mammals that broke down in water and, um, broke down naturally in soil over time with bacteria in the soil, you know, and left for the most part our, our own native wildlife alone, wouldn't that be the right thing? And they go, yeah, that's what we need. That's what we need. And then I explain that for New Zealand, that's a exactly what 1080 is right except we do um unfortunately no matter what we use to try and protect care they are determined to kill themselves with it so whether that's um so we have um we do continue to have problems with kia eating 1080 baits and tipping over um but they also stick their heads in traps and get killed that way so um we've got a real work on trying to care proof our pest control um i i think mostly Andrew, I would say we worked really hard to build a picture of what's at stake. And in fact, the best way to do that is locally. So the best example I can give you of that happening in New Zealand right now is on the east coast of the North Island. They are about to embark on and have begun um, a 1080 aerial operation equaling 120,000 hectares of native bush in an area that is um, predominantly um, uh, a high Māori population um, in terms of the demography um, and, you know, people who are very connected to the land in that rural landscape. What has made that project so successful is that the leadership of that project was given to the local community to work together, to iwi work together, to try and work out what was going on. And for six years now, I have watched one chap in particular who started taking the elders of those two tribes into the bush and showing them that there was there were no new trees coming through because the deer had come in and wiped them all out. There were too many goats, there were too many pests, the birds are gone, and the place that they had grown up with knowing was their bush that they were guardians for was in effect 
um, dying and 1080 is a treatment and one of the tools in the toolkit to breathe life back into our ecosystems. And so maybe that's been um, something that's helped. So context, but increasingly, I think allowing local people to work together to figure it out and then lead the work seems to be the key. Yeah, thanks. Um, before I bring the panelists uh, to respond to this, and I might um, ask Rebecca first to respond, just remember, reminding people, and I haven't actually been um, paying enough attention to this, this is a Q&A, so we want your questions. And there's, I've seen uh, already a great swag of questions that are in the, the Q&A um, box. So, um, and I think we're already touching on some of these things. For example, Mark Jones sort of asks about how we're winning hearts and minds of New Zealanders. And I think Nick was already touched on that a lot. Um, I might come back to a few of the questions in a minute, but uh, Beck, I was just wondering whether you have a, a view on this given uh, around the use of toxins and particularly 1080 and and because we're certainly in Australia, there seems to be um, both uh, conservation oriented use of 1080, but also agriculture use of 1080 and it's having an impact on dingoes. Do you have anything to say on that? So many things, um, but I think I really want to touch on, on three things. Um, Nobody, we, we are legally required as a pastoral leaseholder across a lot of Australia, we're legally required to use 1080. Um, I rebel against that in, in many ways. We do it because we're legally required, but it does impact on dingoes. Um, and I think, you know, Australia is one of the few countries where you can take native species that are hybridised with the domestic species and lump them all into the single term of wild dog. You know, and that's that's really confusing our policy position and, and our behaviour around how we manage a native species. So um, I, it's something I would much rather avoid. We do use it in our integrated pest management control programs, particularly over in, in the West, where, um, as you know, the 1080 comes from a native plant called Gastrolobium, and there is some native resistance to that. So the three things that I really want to touch on, I think, around culling is that the individual animals in a, in a population that are either an invasive species or an overabundant species cannot be held to blame for their collective action. Every individual, every one of those species is, or, or populations is an individual. And so there is an absolute onus on our behalf to be undertaking methods that are as humane as we possibly can. And I think we've still got quite a lot of work to do around that. The second thing is reducing that bycatch and making sure that the programs have as, as few adverse outcomes as we can possibly imagine across the landscape. What we're trying to do is tip the balance in favour of our native species. So using not only the, the chemicals or the, or the method, but wrapping around that an integrated approach so that we reduce the impact of the, of the invasive species, number one, but also the, their control. And secondly, I want to touch too on one of the, the arguments around the need to do this is taking responsibility for decisions that have been made hundreds of years ago. Whether we see it or not, whether we do it or not, there are animals dying in pain out there. What we're trying to do is mitigate some of that by controlling the cause of that. We have, we have lots of photos on our camera traps of animals that are screaming in pain and trying to get away out of the jaws of a cat or, or a fox, you know. So this is, these animals being in the landscape are not benign. Trying to get them out is also not benign right now, and that's where we need innovation to make sure it's as humane as it possibly can be. But it must be done if we're going to try and preserve our native species and with the animal welfare issues of having these predators out there as well. Thanks, Beck. Tim, do you want to have some? Do you have something to say about uh, 1080? I know you have. You've actually researched this a lot and did a really. Um, a, a, well, actually, um, a, you're involved in a report we did on on the use of 1080. Um, yeah, look, I'll just make a couple of comments quickly. I think uh, we've got one advantage over New Zealand in that, as Rebecca was saying, we've got these 1080 plants in Western Australia, so we can talk about 1080 as a natural product. Of course, that's always soothing to people if. Uh, I mean, because it's created in factories, but it is the same thing that is being produced by the plants. The, the other thing is that um, I think death from 1080, that is, that is a cruel death. I mean, I wouldn't walk back from that. 
And I think what I really feel is missing from um, understanding one death versus another is that if a fox didn't die from 1080 poisoning but died from natural causes, what would that look like? And I think that um, in a lot of cases that, that would be an incredibly cruel death that, you know, a, a fox would be very old, it would be um, beaten up by young foxes in its territory where its teeth are wearing down, it's slowly starving to death, getting infections or being repeatedly beaten up by other foxes. And I, I wish we knew, like I wish, I would really love to see some um, mammal research done where people tracked foxes and, and feral cats for that matter to actually understand what is a natural death like. So that if someone says 1080 is cruel, you say, well, this is what the death would have been like if um, if it had been a, a non-1080 death. And in fact, is is that a better death or is it in actually a worse death? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, yes, gosh, it's uh, we could probably have a, a an Aliens Among Us webinar about this whole subject because there's so much into it. I can see some some questions and some comments coming in on the on the Q and A. Um, so I might, but I we might just have to park that for the moment. It's definitely of great interest, as you can see, Nicola in Australia. Um, I think with so many native mammals, it's it's such such a, a big, a more difficult issue for us to use 1080. Um, I, I want to turn now, Nicola, to I guess thinking about maybe you know thinking about lessons for us in Australia about creating a movement a bit like you've created it for Predator Free 2050. I might just ask you to touch on first how you've involved the Maori communities and the role they've played in sort of achieving your Predator Free 2050 goals. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say we have involved them in a couple of ways, but we've, we've in, in all kind of honesty, I think we probably, as usual, involved them too late. Um, and we are kind of turning a corner on that now, which is really heartening to see. I think the key for all New Zealanders and particularly for Māori, right? So if if you are of Māori descent in New Zealand, um, then then by default, the, you are kaitiaki. And, and that means guardian, but it means way more than what we think guardian means, because it means you're, you ha, you carry your, your kaitiaki tangi, your guardianship from hundreds of years before. And the decisions you make about how you look after your environment around you carry forward into the future through hundreds of generations into the future. So it's a very long, like backwards and forwards, long-term way of looking at things. Whereas um, th that's not necessarily, you know, how, how the how the Western world would approach it. So there is, um, and and for um, Maori, their worldview is that you know they are um, descended from uh, the forests, and that the, um, the 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 flora and fauna of the forest are all part of a web of life that they too are part of. So all part of the same family or whanau, if you like. So that's really powerful because actually. Being able to engage with Māori at place, so in New Zealand, um, you know, all Māori are, um, will describe their, their mountain, their river, their marae, um, and, and so being on the ground and at place and, um, and what, you know, what matters to them in their immediate environment is really, really, really important. Um, and so that becomes a really useful conversation starter when you want to engage in peace control in a place. It's not as useful if you're coming at it from a kind of national top-down um, approach. So increasingly, one of the things we're trying to do at Forest and Bird is engage more widely in conversation with Māori at the local marae around what they want to do. And I see other um, organisations and, and departments doing that as well. The other really important thing that applies both to New Zealand and Australia and the way that we were able to build social licence, I think, so easily is that... Um, <laughs> excuse me um New Zealand is very connected to um uh, our identity being um uh basically defined by nature right by the nature of New Zealand uh and Australia is similar and there's some very interesting research um that demonstrate how how this all plays out that's really powerful when you're trying to engage people in a conversation about what's at stake because even though we have a very highly urbanized um population I think you know 86 or 87 percent of us live in towns and cities in New Zealand 
and that's happened in the space of a couple of generations. We are all people who identify with the birds and the plants and the nature all around us. And that has enabled us to be able to um, really connect with New Zealanders about this, this isn't just about that bird, this is about who you are. This is about what it means to be from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I think the same can certainly apply to Australia. The other thing is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but New Zealanders are fiercely competitive, especially as in how it relates to Australians. So um, one thing that um, you will notice is, you know, the, the minute that any rock star or movie star arrives in New Zealand, they're like hardly down the steps of the airplane and some, poor, you know, journalists shoved a microphone in the poor guy's face saying, you know, what do you think about New Zealand? So we, we desperately want um, to be able to put our money where our mouth is and prove that we you know that we are doing this stuff and doing it well and um it works even better if we can demonstrate that we're doing it better than australia that's not to say that we are but that's a useful motivator well i'm not ashamed to say nicola that you are doing it better than us at least uh well at least for your birds and uh we're very envious of what you're doing there um i'm I might, I might just, while I've got you, ask a question that's come in from the chats. Does New Zealand have cane toads? No, I saw that question. Uh, no, we don't. And please don't ever let us have them. Uh, we're, st we're still dealing um, <laughs> with the possums, which you're welcome to have. I used to uh, joke with Gregory Andrews that, you know, I was more than happy to send our possums back uh, at some point. No, cane toads. I but I think that raises a really important point which is it isn't that one particular species is the problem. For New Zealand, with species that have evolved over hundreds of thousands or millions of years in absence of, of invasive, um, you know, mammals or other kinds of animals, um, it's the cumulative impact. And then you can layer climate change impacts on top of that. So, you know, what I'm increasingly seeing in the conversations that I'm having with, um, you know, ministers and, and the prime minister and um, as recently as last week, is we've got to think about the whole of the system. And at the moment, you know, one of the potential downsides of predator free is if we're only focusing on these species, what about the hedgehogs? What about the cats? What about the deer? What about the goats? And more importantly, what about the cumulative impact of all of those things? Because that's the problem. And we need to start thinking about the cumulative impact so that we can kind of look after these places in a more holistic way, which is again, where the the um, Māori kind of way of thinking actually starts to really come to the fore because at the moment well you know we really you know we've we've taken a, a couple of big hits recently in terms of climate change impacts we had Cyclone Gabriel which we're still reeling from you know I know Australia um, has had some significant impacts as well we know that by building the resilience of those natural ecosystems, by removing those pests and, and the cumulative impact, we can actually protect our communities better by having those um, ecosystems thriving and cranking the way they're supposed to, not being like an orchestra with a whole string section missing, which is what it feels like at the moment. Mm, yeah, look, I, I love the way you talk about that, I guess, both thinking about the whole ecosystem, but thinking about those multitude of threats and, and thinking of systems-based um, responses to that. I might, um, we're starting to run out of time, Nicola. I might just come back to the other panelists for a minute because um, I guess we could talk for a few more hours on this. There's so much in, in it and we'll have to think about whether we do that. Um, and I feel like I haven't done justice to all the questions that have come through. So we'll just have to, um, I think, respond offline to most of those. Um, but it's such an interesting conversation. Um, I might come to Rebecca and just ask her a bit about, um, you know, if we are to do something like predator free 2050 in Australia, but obviously it's going to be, have to be different because we don't, it's not just uh, uh, the native birds we want to protect, it's our mammals that are going down the tube thanks to some very uh, effective introduced predators. Um, Rebecca, I mean, how would you go about building something that starts to replicate the sort of momentum that Predator Free 2050 ha has? I mean, do we call it Fred Feral Free Australia? Or I guess it probably is not important what we call it, but you know, you've, you're you um, a major land manager, your organization, Bush Heritage Australia, and got all these uh, deep relationships with landowners all around Australia. How would you start something like a Predator Free 2050 movement in Australia? Thanks, Andrew. I think it's a really good question. And um, I'm certainly not in a position to talk for, for you know, the partners that, that we work with. But every 
group that we talk to, whether they're traditional owners, whether they're farmers, rural communities, they all understand, they see, they know the impact that these ferals are having across the country. The groups that we really need to work with, I think, are, are the urbanised populations that um, feel that their pets might be a threat, number one, but they also, you know, have a have some level of squeam around um, large scales of, of culling. That's really what it's going to take if we're going to be predator-free, if we're going to be feral-free and try and tip the balance back and, and restore health to country, which is what we're talking about. And seconding Nicola's point of view, that again, again, I'm not trying to speak for any traditional owner, person or, or group, but what I've learned is that everything is important and thinking about that integrated approach. So building health, healing country is about building back those exquisite and intricate relationships between each of the individual species, plant and animal across the landscape and making sure that everything really does work together. One of the things I think I'm really excited about, and the technology exists, we probably do still need a little bit of work around the social license, is gene driving. So working with innovative technology to try and reduce the number of individuals born in the first place so that we're actually reducing the number that need to be killed at the other end of life. Thanks. Yeah, I noticed one of the questions in the Q&A just raised that topic, so that's really good. That's certainly lots of promise on that front. Thank, thank you. Rebecca, um, Tim, we've, uh, I, I know you and I have talked a bit in the past about well, what does a, an initiative like this look like in Australia and is it at all possible given that Australia is a bloody big island? Um, Tim, what would you say about sort of trying to establish a movement like Predator Free 2050, establishing a movement like that in Australia? Yeah, look, I, I really don't know how one would do that. But what I would like to say about New Zealand in terms of uh, what Australia can learn from it is, you know, we've had this compassionate conservation movement rise up, particularly in Australia, and their argument is that killing feral animals, it is becoming socially less and less acceptable. Um, and some of the articles, they're almost... Um, there's almost a threat there that um, you know you, you're retrograde, you're old-fashioned. This is old male oppression. The history is moving away from that. And then if you look at New Zealand, where the killing is so gung ho, involving the whole community and children, uh, I know that you know the Jane Goodall Society has looked at New Zealand and just recoiled and thought this is really regressive. This is backward. It's primitive. But if you look at New Zealand socially, I mean, there's many arguments that it's a very progressive society, first country in the world to give. Um, votes to all women, nuclear free um, since 1987, ranked by Voiceless as having some of the world's best animal welfare laws. So it does show that you can be so socially progressive doesn't mean that you don't protect your native animals by killing introduced animals. And so I think that um, that that is something uh, that that we can hold up and say that no, we, we will keep killing. Um, killing introduced animals that there's not a sign of backwardness. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so many, so many important issues there. I might come back to Nicola. Nicola, you, you, as our special guest today, you have the last say. Um, what advice do you give Australians to, if we want to embark on our predator-free 2050 journey? I mean, we, do we just uh, copy what you've done and? Uh, <laughs> make it bigger or is it I guess the answer is more complex than that what would you what advice do you give uh I think what I've heard on this call alone um is a cracking start right I don't think you should just copy what we do because it's a completely different ecological context right you um and, and we talked about this the other day, you know, it took me a little moment to get my head around the fact that you don't have traps here, there and everywhere uh, in your backyards and in your parks and reserves. And of course you don't, because you might, uh, you, you don't want to knock over some of your amazing um, native wildlife. So um, what I would say, a couple of things, um, I have heard similar feedback largely around, um, you know, the anti 1080 sort of debate, um, Tim and some other stuff around people saying, you know, actually our wildlife has reached an equilibrium. It's all fine out there. And we know that it's not. So um, 
have courage, have courage to have these conversations. Um, and I would, um, I would listen to the concerns of your community. You know, I had to listen a lot when I first started where I was a bit probably gung ho and yeah, let's just go and kill all the things. And, and you know, on reflection, that wasn't the right messaging and isn't actually what I believe. And so um, listening to your communities and, and working at place, like the kind of work that you're doing, um, Rebecca, you know, we are and working particularly with your local rural, urban and indigenous communities. And, and if the community buy it and, and want to lead it, then you're kind of halfway there. But if you're kind of standing up on a on a table somewhere and telling people what to do, no one likes being told what to do, um, and presenting them with, with what's at stake, right? Because one of the biggest problems we continue to have in New Zealand is even though we have the highest proportion of threatened species in the world, yay, we're number one. Um, uh, all of our, like most of the public think our wildlife's all fine out there. So when I told members of the public that in areas without pest control in New Zealand, which is most of New Zealand, um, 19 out of 20 Kiwi chicks don't survive to one year of age, people just fundamentally don't believe me, even though that's true. So 95% of Kiwi chicks don't survive to one year of age in areas where there's no pest control, which is most of New Zealand. But where we are working, and often that is community grassroots stuff, where we are doing pest control, where we have removed the predators, then they thrive. Um, I think it's really important to let people know what's at stake and then give them a sense of hope about what they can do uh, in terms of actions. Because I see one of two things, um, and Rebecca's heard me talk about this before, I see... Um, Either people get completely overwhelmed and depressed and it all feels too hard and we get kind of stuck in the climate change panic kind of overwhelm bucket, or we kind of don't engage because it, we're constantly being told that our wildlife is nice and it's all fine out there. So tell them, be honest, you know, keep telling that story, have the courage to tell that story and then work with communities on solutions. That'll be my advice. Yeah, that's great advice. Look, uh, this has been a great discussion. Um, I think it's, it's, it's inspired me. Um, I mean, it's clearly, you've got a long way to go to achieve your predator-free 2050 goal. Uh, Australia's got a long way to go even just to slow down the rate of extinctions it's got um, underway. So we've all got a lot of work to do. I'm gonna have to wrap this up because I feel like we're just getting into it, but um, maybe we'll think about doing something another time and um, really have to apologize to many of the people who have put the questions. We'll have a go at trying to answer them offline, but um, there's some great comments. And I think we touched on a lot of the issues that were raised by those questions anyway. So um, I want to thank the panelists, um, Tim Lowe, uh, our, uh, uh, well, he's, he's our co-founder of the Invasive Species Council, uh, writer and ecologist, and he's working on updating feral future right now. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Rebecca Spindler, the Conservation Director for Bush Heritage Australia. Thanks for, for coming on today. And Nicola, I want to really thank you for your time, um, for all your inspiration and uh, the great things you're doing, doing on um, with Forest and Bird. And um, I'm sure we'll have a lot more to do with each other over the coming years. So that's it for today. I had, thankfully, we had um, uh, well, we had, a, we had over 90 people join our, our call today, so there was a really good turnout. We'll um, we have it, these about three to four times a year, so look out for the next notification and the topic. We'll find uh, another amazing guest to talk to you about some of those uh, really thorny invasive species issues. There is a recording of this event, uh, so if you missed it or you want to share it with your friends, um, look out on our website in the next few days uh, on um, to, to see that. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us on Aliens Among Us webinar and have a great day. See you later. <laughs>